Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. What to do with the CPS windfall? High temperatures, natural gas prices driving up CPS energy bills. And since the utility pays the city of San Antonio a portion of its revenues, that means the city is taking in tens of millions more than it expected to. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us how the city council is looking to use that money. Garrett, there seems to be a couple different options on what to do with this windfall. Couple options, but a lot of dollars as meters are, meters are spinning like crazy in this heat and costing more every time they do. The city looking at an extra 75 million beyond what they expected from CPS. Now, the city staff has already recommended using about 25 of that for an aquifer protection program, sidewalks, and obtaining a warehouse. However, the $50 million remaining is really what's at question, and that's what city council members tackled today during a budget work session. Now, city staff has proposed putting some of that $50 million into an assistance program for low-income customers, but most would be divvied up among all customers as a credit on their October bills. The credits would be based on energy usage during July, so the average residential customer would get about 31 bucks back. Meanwhile, the biggest energy users, a handful of companies, could get around $100,000, causing some council members to balk. Now, there was a lot of discussion on different ways to divvy up the money if the city moves ahead with a rebate idea. District 9's John Courage, for example, wants to give back $75, but only to San Antonio CPS customers, not those out in the county. I, I just can't justify that myself. Uh, and so I hope that as we look at this, we're going to focus on making sure any benefit that's received from the city giving its resources is going to go to city residents. Uh, and, and I say, too, I don't think it needs to go to businesses. Previous suggestions for alternate uses of the money, like domestic violence or street maintenance, appeared to take a backseat during today's discussion. But District 1's Mario Bravo is still pushing hard to use the money instead on programs to help prepare for future extreme weather through programs like weatherizing homes. Now, ultimately, council members didn't come to any sort of clear consensus today, but the mayor says they are going to discuss this again before they pass the budget. Live downtown, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. After weeks of delays, the termination hearing for Uvalde School District Police Chief Pete Arredondo finally has a date set. It is scheduled for August 24th. The family of victims were informed about the hearing before the news went public earlier today. That board will meet at 530 on that Wednesday night. The meeting open to the public and KSAT 12 will live stream the hearing on our website. The original hearing was set for July 22nd. However, it was postponed twice at the request of Arredondo's lawyer. Arredondo has been heavily criticized for his actions and inactions during the law enforcement response to the Robb Elementary mass shooting. As of now, he's on unpaid administrative leave. The new CEO of ERCOT will be paid nearly $2 million in the first year of his contract. Today, the ERCOT board announced that Pablo Vegas will take over as CEO. He's currently a U Ohio utility executive. Here's how that salary breaks down. Annual base pay of $990,000, a one-time bonus of nearly $250,000 at the end of 2022, along with $500,000 in relocation assistance. His contract was approved by the ERCOT and the Public Utility Commission Board that control the power grid for most of Texas. Vegas will also get 25 days of vacation each year. A jury currently deliberating in the trial of a man accused of brutally murdering a woman back in 2020. Rafael Castillo has been on trial since last Wednesday and charged with first degree murder. Today, closing arguments were heard. Erica Hernandez has more on how the prosecution and the defense tried to sway the jury. Both sides took about 30 to 45 minutes during closing arguments. If found guilty, Rafael Castillo is facing up to life in prison. And a guilty verdict is what the state says the jury should come back with because of eyewitness testimony from three people, all who said that Castillo allegedly attacked Nicole Perry back on November 2020 with an ax and a machete. Perry and Castillo were both living in a home with three others on the southwest side where the alleged murder took place. The defense countered, saying that the state didn't have reliable evidence to prove Castillo killed Perry and that everyone in that house gave conflicting testimony. Who was there 
and all three had different answers. Again, they're witnesses, completely contradictory to each other. You can, there is zero way that you can believe what all of these witnesses told you. Currently, the jury is still deliberating, but if they do come back with a verdict and it is guilty, the punishment phase in this case would begin tomorrow. At the Kedina Reeves Justice Center, Eric Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. A man is recovering tonight after being trapped inside a freight train car for nearly 14 hours. This unusual scene happening at the Union Pacific Rail Yard near Quintana Road. Train workers heard screaming and crying from inside the train cars, which led to the man being discovered. The man was inside a small crawl space trapped by huge metal coils, which officials say weigh about 4,000 pounds. It's just sitting there hiding, and when they were loading cars, apparently or somehow the, the load shifted and it caught his foot in between two coils. A ladder truck helped fire crews get a view of him from above with other equipment in about an hour of time. They finally got him out of there. Officials believe the man secretly boarded the train in Eagle Pass sometime on Monday. A head on collision on Loop 1604 involving an off duty Bear County deputy's vehicle left one woman hospitalized overnight. This crash happened just before 10 o'clock last night. According to officers there at the scene, the deputy was on his way to work when he crashed head on with another vehicle. That other vehicle was on the wrong side of the road at the time. The driver was found unconscious and taken to Bamsey for serious injuries. The deputy had only minor injuries. They are viewer questions that have flooded our trust index inbox all about the monkeypox vaccine. Who needs it? Is it the same as the smallpox vaccine? And will the old vaccine still work? Courtney Friedman tapped our local experts to get those questions answered for you. The vaccine currently being used against monkeypox is a smallpox vaccine. It's a newer vaccine that's being used now. It is related, it's considered the third generation smallpox vaccine, but it is also active against monkeypox. Dr. Jason Bowling is an infectious disease expert for UT Health San Antonio and University Health and says this vaccine actually received FDA approval in 2019. So it is different than the older vaccines people received decades ago. They stopped using that in 1972. And then in between, there was a second vaccine for smallpox that people might also be thinking about that really was just used for people that work with the vaccine in labs. The current version was also mainly made for people who work in labs, but also in preparation should smallpox ever return. So the question is, if you got the older smallpox vaccines, are you protected against monkeypox? That's a great question. And the, the, the short answer is we don't know which is not a real satisfying answer. Bowling said for the older vaccine, boosters are recommended after about 10 years. And so that means if we stop vaccinating people in 1972, really a lot of people would be due for that. That being said, there may still be some re residual protection. But it's hard to tell how much protection. That's why we're labeling it be careful on our case at trust index. But if you're eligible, meaning you've come in contact with monkeypox, Bowling has a definitive suggestion. So if you're exposed to a monkeypox case, even if you had that prior smallpox vaccine sometime in the past, you would still be benefit from getting the new vaccine. Yes. Bear County originally started with about 1000 monkeypox vaccines, and we are already on the wait list to receive more. If you want to know if you're eligible and where you can get the vaccine, head to Metro Health's website. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And if you want to submit a question, we'd love to hear from you. See more trust index stories. You can do that too. Just scan the QR code on your screen or go to KSAT.com slash trust index. Students in the San Antonio Independent School District now with their first day in the books for students at Burbank High School. Today was the first day they got to walk into a brand new building. The $78 million project was part of the 2016 SAISD bond. The new building includes a skywalk, open classroom concepts, workspaces and smart technology. To check out all of our return to class coverage, go to KSAT.com. Meanwhile, a steamy day to head back. <laughs> yes. At least we had some we had some cooler weather with all the rain and the clouds. Oh, yeah. wasn't so bad. Yeah, we had uh, two days with high temperatures in the 80s. 88 the high temperature the past couple of days. The last time we had that was back in late May. So it was a big change, big difference. All that tropical moisture making a difference. You know, we had one shower 
just barely work its way into Bear County here. You look at this over the past hour and <laughs> just barely making it toward Calaveras Lake before starting to fizzle out. There isn't much left of it, but just on the eastern side of Calaveras Lake and we're talking just within 1604 near East Central High School on the southeast side of town. We've got one little shower that popped up, but by and large dry out there today. Just a mixture of sun and clouds. 97. That's the high today. Exactly average the record high 103 set back in 1969. Hey, Gonzalez at 100 divine 95 comfort as well. 95 Canyon Lake about 92 98 New Braunfels. And as we go through the evening, temperatures just gradually falling through the 90s and 80s, that 10% chance of a stray shower through about 8 PM and then the sky clearing out. We do have some other rain chances to talk about and a little tropical system we're watching in the Caribbean that should move toward the Gulf. We'll let you know what that can mean for rain chances in a bit. Thank you, Adam. Hunting season just a few weeks away, but now is the time to get your licenses for the upcoming season. Officials with Texas Parks and Wildlife say the current licenses will expire at the end of August. This excludes the year from purchase all water fishing licenses. Something new this year is hunters and anglers can purchase super combo licenses online. This will allow them to get digital tags for harvested deer, turkey, and oversized red drum all together. For more information, head to ksat.com. Fall hunting season starts next month. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. This is the TransGuide camera I-37 at Hackberry. You can see the traffic is backed up there in the far right lane as people get off the highway. We do want to let you know there's some major construction and closures that you need to know about for the week. Stephen Cavazos gives you a heads up on those detours. The work around the Alamo City continues through the month of August. Let's go ahead and see what commuters can expect because there is a lot happening there along 410 over on the west side of San Antonio. Now, this is an area we mentioned quite often, but barrier work will continue at least up until August 20th. This is according to TxDOT, and during that time, it's going to be from 7 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon. So watch for those crews out there. That's when you can expect the full closure of the northbound entrance ramp from Marbach Road. Let's take a leap this time to I-10 in Kendall County. Gosh, we all know that there's a lot of work that typically takes place out there. And according to text out, the work will continue at least up until Friday, August 19th. It'll start at nine in the morning and should wrap hopefully by four in the afternoon. During the time, single lane closure on the westbound frontage road uh, from Scenic Loop Road to US 87. Now let's go ahead and take an even bigger jump there to FM 725 725. Pardon me in Comal County operational improvements. Now this is current, but according to text out, should wrap on Thursday, September 1st. It's from 9 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon. During that time, drivers full closure of the northbound to southbound turnaround at I-35. But of course, that information along with other construction spots now on our website. Grab your phones, open your camera app and scan that QR code that will take you directly to the KSAT traffic page. And that has the list of all the closures taking place in and around our area. President Biden calls on to step forward in the fight against increasing inflation. What his signing of what's called the Inflation Reduction Act means for you. Plus, have you felt it yet? A little less pain at the pump right now. We have the latest gas prices around San Antonio and how long this dip in prices is expected to last. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and tonight we're going to have an update for you on the unwelcome guest who exposed himself on a home security camera. Last week, San Antonio police said that that incident was not an active investigation, but that's changed since our story aired. But we're now learning in the case tonight on The Night Beat. Also, this was the first day of classes for students in the San Antonio Independent School District, and we're getting a firsthand look at its new state-of-the-art security system and also how it's protecting students. Also, an announcement that many of you have waited to hear. We are hearing from the families in Uvalde just days before Pete Arredondo's future is to be decided at Uvalde CISD. We'll see you for those stories tonight on The Night Beat. See you then. Thank you, Stephanie. We've got some late breaking news in that murder trial. The case of Rafael Castillo accused of murdering a woman with an axe and a machete. After an hour of deliberating, the jury has found him guilty. Castillo facing from five to 99 years or life in prison. The punishment phase of this trial will begin tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. And of course, we will have a crew in court to get all the latest information. But again, Rafael Castillo found guilty of murder just moments ago.
And moving to other news here at six now to the investigation into the fatal shooting of a youth football coach in Dallas County. 39 year old Yakub Talib waking up behind bars after Dallas police say he turned himself in. Talib's attorney releasing a statement saying in part that Talib regrets the tragic loss of life, but that he turned himself in so he could tell his side of the story. A manhunt for Talib has been going on since Saturday's shooting seen on cell phone video. 43 year old coach Mike Hickman had been shot. He was rushed to the hospital where he died. A witness in that shooting says Hickman's nine year old son on the field when his dad was shot. And I held him like my son. It was very, very, very hard to hold him and console him more than just a coach. Great father, great man, um, great role model, great mentor. Police are saying they were told of a quote disagreement among coaching staff and the officiating crew end quote the suspect of the br the suspect is the brother of former NFL quarterback and Super Bowl champion Akib Talib. Both of the Talib brothers were coaching the other team that was playing at the time of that shooting. Back here at home, gas prices are tanking in a good way. We found gas at several stations around town selling for about 315 a gallon. Prices have fallen more than a dollar a gallon over the past nine weeks from those painful June record prices. And drivers are noticing when they're filling up. Uh, this right now, I think, is uh, 60. Okay, what's the most it ever cost you? Uh, 105. That's a difference. The reason for the big slide comes down to concerns about the economy, not just here, but globally, especially in China. The price of oil has slid down to about $92 a barrel today. That's the lowest since before the Russian invasion on Ukraine. If oil continues to drop, you can expect the price at the pump to follow. And as we turn to our friend Adam Kasky, who's back after a few days off, mm -hmm. we're talking about our next rain chances because it was great what we got over the last couple of days, but there's no doubt we still need some more, Adam. Yeah, and it was really good drought denting rain south of San Antonio and even along the Rio Grande. I mean, we're talking six inches plus farther south of town. You get into northeast Webb County, even Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen counties and closer to the Rio Grande. But here's the stat for you. Check this out year to date. OK, so from January 1st to this date, August 16th, this is the driest year so far on record. We average about 19.3 inches of precipitation and so far we've had 5.44. Now that's officially at the airport in town, the official reporting station. We know there have been other accumulations elsewhere and higher amounts in some locations, but that's just for our official reporting site. All right, let's take a look at the radar. A little bit of activity over the past hour or two, but a lot of it's simmering down. You look at the big picture and you go south of town. What we had in Atascosa County, those brief, quick splash and dash showers. Well, they're dashing and dissipating and even in southern and eastern Bear County within 1604 between 410 and 1604 Calaveras Lake, Mitchell Lake, not a whole lot left over. Just a quick little brief insignificant shower and then east of town, northern Gonzales County, parts of Lavaca County, Moulton area. We had some brief downpours, but and a little bit of lightning closer to I-10, but a lot of that is simmering down as well and not a whole lot left over with this activity. So let's talk about what's on its way and what our rain chances are in the days ahead. First of all, this is what moved away. This is the shower activity, the tropical moisture we had over the past few days. Now it greeted parts of very drought stricken West Texas with some much needed rainfall. That's being steered off to the northwest into New Mexico and Arizona. We're watching this little area of energy, disturbed weather in the Caribbean, your Nicaragua. That's going to be sliding to the northwest and it's going to be interacting with a lot of land and that's going to inhibit its development over the next few days. But by Friday, Saturday, it's likely to be in the western Gulf of Mexico. At that point, there's the off chance of a little bit of development right now. 0% chance of development within two days. Within five days, we're talking a 20% chance of development. So right now, we really don't anticipate a whole lot from that system, even along the Gulf Coast, not a lot of moisture. You look at those rain chances tomorrow, 0%. By Friday, we're up to 30. Sunday, Monday from that system, maybe 20%. All right, here's a look outside. Beautiful time lapse of those cumulus clouds rolling by right now. 
We're at 96, dew point is 66, so it feels like we're up to 99 with that southeasterly breeze at 8 miles per hour. And you can see here in the big picture where the rain cooled air is. West Texas, El Paso 82, and look at Alpine, 74 degrees right now in Alpine after over two inches of rainfall today. All right, let's talk temps. 92 Uvalde, 98 New Braunfels, Pleasanton currently at 94. And for the most part, we've got readings in the mid 90s, just under 100 today. Tomorrow morning, we start the day in the mid 70s. So more of the same mid 70s in the morning, then well into the 90s by the afternoon. Castroville about 97, Bulverde 95, New Braunfels up to 100, and Seguin about 98. And here's your case at 12 hour forecast. In the morning hours, those are low clouds to start the day, but by 10 o'clock becoming sunny noon, partly cloudy near 90, then a high temperature locally of 97. We are one 100 degree day away from tying the all time record. So we could do it on Thursday. We're forecasting 99, then we could do it again early next week at about 99. It's possible. Wouldn't surprise me if we did it. I guess I'm with you guys. If we're this close, let's just do it. Oh, We've come this far. You know? We swayed her. We did. Yeah. We got her to think the same way we're thinking, which it is happens. scary. It is. <laughs> All right, let's go live to Las Palapas right now. Talking about the K-Set Pigskin Classic right around the corner. I don't know who's going to be more excited about being in that dome. Is it going to be the players, the bands, the crowd? I mean, there's a lot of people looking forward to this, Greg. Yeah, me too. I'm excited about it. Hey, if you drop by this one located at 281 and 1604, you know where all the giant flyovers are. We have coupons, we have t-shirts, and we're selling tickets to the KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022. The big triple header in the Dome. In a moment when we come back, news from Longhorn Land. It's not good. Two key players already lost to injuries and other players suspended. And we'll have a preview of our KSAP Pigskin Classic coming up. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome live to the Las Palapas at 281 and 1604. For, we're selling tickets to the KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022, presented by your San Antonio area Chevy dealers. That's all, all three games, one day in the Alamo Dome, one week from this Saturday. In a moment, a preview of one of those teams participating, but first. Texas Longhorns have lost two key players due to serious knee injuries suffered in their scrimmage over the weekend. It's after both fifth-year senior guard Junior Angelau and wide receiver Isaiah Nayar tore their anterior cruciate ligaments. Angelau started 34 games over the last three seasons. Nayar was a transfer from Wyoming, was expected to take some of the pressure off Xavier Worthy, who was the team's leading receiver last season. And Alabama transfer Aguia Hall has been suspended for trying to pry a boot off of his car and was arrested. My job as a coach is to put our players in the best position to be successful, not just in football, but in life, in the classroom. Uh, I felt like this, this situation called for that. Um, this was not something that was based off of one incident. This is, this is something that was a body of work that I felt like I need to help the young man, and that's what we're going to do. And I think that he's uh, been very receptive to it and um, hoping when he does come back and join us, uh, he's going to be in a really good spot to help contribute to the team. All right, after beating the New Orleans Saints in their preseason opener 17-13 on a last-second touchdown, the Houston Texans went back to work today to prepare to take on the defending Super Bowl champion Los Angeles Rams on Friday in SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles. Among the cuts made today to get down to 85, Chad Beebe, the son of former Buffalo Bills wide receiver Don Beebe, to go along with Jordan Jenkins, running back B.J. Emmons, and long snapper Harrison L.A. One of the keys this year is improving the run game. We saw a glimpse of that Saturday when rookie Damian Pierce put on a show, five carries, 49 yards. One reason why why Scott Quisenberry was brought in from the L.A. Chargers to improve the offensive line. Just as a unit collectively, I know for a fact that uh, we're working together more as one, you know, and communicating a lot better and just relying on each other to be in the right place at the right time. And, uh, you know, we had some good runs on uh, Saturday night, and, you know, we're going to have the mentality to carry that over into this game against the Rams and then the next one and then into the regular season. 
All right. Now, one of the teams participating in the KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022 presented by your San Antonio area Chevy dealers will be the Reagan Rattlers. In fact, they're located right down the street from where we are. Now, the Rattlers will be taking on Smithson Valley in the opening game of the triple header, the first game in the Dome on August the 27th. Rattlers come into the season ranked 36 in Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine, top 50 teams in the state in Class 6A. They're the favorites to take District 28-6A after losing only one game in District, undefeated Johnson. Head coach Lyndon Hamilton has 12 starters back, six each on offense and defense of a team that finished seven and four as by district finalists led by running back Carson Green on offense at 2,800 career yards after being limited to just four games last season due to injury with a stellar defensive line led by Matt Quick. It's a really tough district, but we just got to stay uh, consistent with our work and just keep the ground up so we can win the district over again. You know, that experience is everything. Kind of put a fire under all of us. It's motiv motivating us, you know, each and every day from the offseason all the way till now. You know, on the 27th, we actually get to play our first morning game as a, as a varsity program at 11.30 in the Dome. Uh, this pigskin classic in case at 12, uh, you know, we're excited to be a part of it, and we can't wait till it gets here. And we'll be happy to have them because that is just a – just over a week away now. Remember, it's a week from this Saturday. If you come out here, the Las Palapas at 281 and 1604. We're giving away coupons, T-shirts. We're selling tickets for just $15 each for three big games. We'll send it back to you now in the studio. Looking forward to it, Greg. Like you said, I'm as excited as the players, I think, that we're going to be part of all of this. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. This is going to be fun. Yeah. yeah. All right, after the break, we are talking to the president and CEO of Haven for Hope about them being over capacity, well over capacity at that shelter, what she thinks needs to happen going forward. Coming up. It is much more than just a homeless shelter. It is a transitional center where people can go to get help, get off the street, get a meal if that's all they want, or completely change their life if that's what they want as well. Haven for Hope President and CEO Kim Jeffries joins us now live on the KSAD Q&A. Kim, thank you so much for taking time out. And I know it's a busy time at Haven for Hope. I mean, you're over capacity. It was something like you're at 113 percent capacity there is that still the case and what seems to be driving this right now what are you seeing the biggest population there increase yeah thanks for having me first of all but we are actually at 118 percent of our design capacity today um, and we're seeing a surge in single women and um, families and 75 percent of the families that we're seeing today are one parent household families most of them single mothers with children what are some of the factors that have led you all here? I mean, this is obviously a place that provides services like these all the time, but what do you think is behind this current increase? It's interesting because I've only been in the job 10 months, but I think we're at the perfect storm of earlier this year, the eviction moratoriums were lifted. Um, we're seeing this rising inflation um, where things that you need like gas and food are more expensive. And then our housing market has increased over the last year. And so rent has gone up. Um, we're seeing evictions as the number one reason why families are coming to us or not being able to afford the rent that they're in apartments right now because the rent has gone up. So it's all kind of the combination of all of those that has come together and we're seeing more families than we've ever seen. This is the most families we've housed at Haven at any one time. We have 102 family dorm rooms that are full and 60 additional families sleeping in um, uh, common spaces. That's what I was gonna say. I mean, when this happens, you take some of the hallways and offices and whatever you can to make sure you don't turn people away, correct? Yes, we are the only shelter and uh, transformational campus in San Antonio committed to never turning a family away. So they can come anytime, day or night, and we will find uh, a place for them to, to have a place to sleep. We're not gonna let a kid sleep in a car or out on the street. Yeah, and I've been there before where the chapel has been used at night for sleeping and then it's cleaned up and used during the day for the, the regular services that you have there. So I know that there's a lot of common spaces that, that are being used classrooms, chapels, anything we can find right now. So what what do you feel like needs to happen going forward? I mean, is there is this just about kind of weathering the, the numbers at the moment or are there solutions that you think can be put into practice right now or are in the works to help make space and also not only make space, but get people in a space where they're safe, where they're sheltered? Yeah, I think there's two things. You know, when you look at 
upstream, making sure that we're putting money into prevention and diversion from homelessness so they don't come to Haven Store. Um, the city has relocation money. Um, the county is doing a really great job with mortgage assistance and there's utility assistance. So making sure people are taking advantage of those um, resources that are available to them and we can help navigate them at Haven if they want to give us a call uh, before so they don't come to our door. But then it's, you know, making sure there's affordable housing and permanent supportive housing for people to move into. Um, you know, only 2% of the units in our community are in the 30% AMI um, area median income, which is what most of our low income, extremely low income families might need. 42% of the families coming to us have income. And so they have income. They just don't have enough income to pay the average rent of $1,300 in our community. So we need affordable housing. Um, and the city has money in the housing bond to do that. We just need developers to come to the table and neighborhoods to accept those projects. Can I can I make a jump here and ask you have people right now on your campus that could qualify for some of this affordable housing, but you don't have the affordable housing to put them in. Is that correct? Correct. So the, the city did a, a housing implementation plan and determined we need about 7,000 units at 30% of the area median income in order to accommodate all the individuals. And, a, and that, you know, there's thousands of people who are housing insecure because of that in our community. So we the, the money's out there in the bond for the projects. Now we just need to get them rolling. 118% capacity right now. And we know that that's up from the last time we talked to you, I believe just last week. Uh, that number has gone up. So somebody watching this, what can they do if they want to help out right now with this issue? What are their options? Uh, they can make a donation to help us offset the cost. It costs about $25 a day for somebody to stay on Haven's campus. So even a $25 donation makes a difference. We have a wish list online too um, for supplies that we need to help support these families. So they can go to havenforhope.org and check out our wish list and ship things directly to us. And then as housing projects come up, I think just being open-minded and learning more about the housing projects, the affordable housing or the permanent supportive housing in their neighborhoods, being more curious, asking more questions to see if it's something that, that their area might need. Yeah, don't be so anti-affordable housing. Come, come at it with an open mind. Yes, we've, it's gotta be somewhere. Um, otherwise, we're, this situation is only gonna get worse. Kim, how many people, when you say 118% capacity, how many people is that right now at Haven for Hope? Uh, just a little over 1,600 right now are at Haven for Hope. Wow. So we can we can accept up to 18 and 17 as our overflow capacity. Um, and then we have a, some, a couple emergency spaces that we can use if we need to. Kim Jeffries, president and CEO of Haven for Hope. Thank you so much. Havenforhope.org if you want to help. Appreciate your time, Kim. Thank you. We'll be right back. President Joe Biden signed the landmark Inflation Reduction Act today, a massive spending bill that Democrats hope will reshape much of the American economy. The president, along with administration officials, now gearing up to hit the road, touting a growing number of legislative successes that they hope will bolster party prospects in the November midterms. Chris Wynn in Washington with the very latest. A victory lap for President Joe Biden Tuesday as he signed a sweeping $750 billion health care tax and climate bill into law. Today offers further proof that the soul of America is vibrant, the future of America is bright, and the promise of America is real and just beginning. The Inflation Reduction Act represents the largest climate investment in American history and makes major changes to health policy by giving Medicare the power to negotiate the prices of certain prescription drugs for the first time. The Inflation Reduction Act does so many things that for so many years, so many of us have fought to make happen. Administration officials say the act will reduce the deficit and be paid for through new taxes, including a 15% minimum tax on large corporations and a 1% tax on stock buybacks. West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, a major holdout throughout the lengthy legislative process, played a key role in advancing the bill. This is what the American people want, solutions and a balanced energy approach. Democrats relying on a budgetary procedure to pass the bill along party lines with zero support from the GOP. Democrats are catastrophically out of touch with what American families actually do care about. And their reckless taxing and spending proves it. 
The win caps off a string of Democratic legislative successes the party hopes will translate to electoral success in the November midterms. In Washington, I'm Chris Wynn. A buzz story today from our own backyard. A deer caught on video caught in a fence. It happened on the northeast side in a neighborhood. It happened in the Oak Crest neighborhood this morning. According to the viewer who captured that video, it wasn't long after the deer was discovered that a firefighter arrived there. Yeah, they were actually actually able to bend the bars of the fence just enough no. and let the little guy out. Got loose, able to escape. Job well done by the San Antonio Fire Department. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I kind of feel like I've been in that situation before. Stuck? Stuck, stuck in Just a fence metaphorically. Metaphorically. Like <laughs> 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 well, you think you're doing something, you think you're moving forward, but. Yeah. Sounds really like a dream, making, right? We've all had those yeah, dreams. Exactly. I can't move. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're looking for more rain chances around here. We had some good soaking rain. We'll get into some of the totals in just a moment, but uh, we really, of course, need it elsewhere. We didn't get a whole lot locally, just under a quarter of an inch, but uh, good accumulations south of town. Kerrville now, by the way, we just heard from city of Kerrville today in stage one watering starting midnight tonight. Watching tropical energy in the Caribbean that's going to be moving toward the Gulf of Mexico, and we are just one 100 degree day away from the record, the all time record of 59 100 degree days in a year. We're in second place right now and we could come close a few times. So let's first start with the rainfall. Check this out. It was just a beautiful system. We knew it would take good, deep tropical moisture and that's what moved in. Catula over four, almost four and a half inches of rain. Uh, Northeastern Webb County, little area of six inches. You put the drought monitor on there and you can see we got some much needed rainfall in very drought stricken parts of South Texas and well, pretty much all of Texas is drought stricken, but especially drought stricken areas getting some good rain. Divine 1.52, Pleasanton about nine tenths of an inch, and Pearsall had over three inches of rain. So this was good. That's what we needed. And I know not everybody got it, but at least some folks got some needed rainfall, especially filling up the water tanks and the ranches far south of town. Here's where that action is right now. Still some moisture left over. It's in far west Texas. Brought some much needed rainfall. Parts of far west Texas, including Alpine area, Fort Davis as well, and locations northward. Over two inches today in Alpine. It's good. They haven't seen a whole lot of rain until the monsoon season started up. And the upper level highs, it's broken up right now and pretty weak, but it's still steering that tropical moisture into the desert southwest. We're watching this little area of active weather in the Caribbean, and this is going to be passing over land and basically the Yucatan Peninsula and emerging the Gulf of Mexico by Friday, Saturday time frame. Odds are against this developing into a tropical system that would then get a name, right? Organizing that much. But of course, once these systems get into the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico and things change, they can rapidly accelerate. So we'll keep an eye on it. But right now, just a 20% chance of developing into a more organized system at that time. Otherwise, weak boundary moves in Thursday, Friday, so a 20 to 30 percent chance of a few showers around town and then just a 20 percent chance on Monday or Sunday and even into Monday as a result of that little disturbance that we're watching. You look at our time lapse and we had some decent vertical growth in some of these clouds locally that it just wasn't enough to drop any showers, at least not over the airport and just a few pockets of light rain south and east of Bear County. 97 the high today. We're 58 days now. That's how many 100 degree days we've had. The all time record is 59 set back in 2009. We'll be close in the days ahead. Right now we're in the low to mid 90s. 95 Port SA, Converse 97, 94 in Holotus and dew points in the 60s. So a bit of mugginess in the air. Of course you feel it and tomorrow Start the day, the day at 77, make it up to 97 for the afternoon high temperature and near 100 on Thursday. 99 is what we're expecting. Then again, next Tuesday, 99. It's we could do it. We could do it. Mm -hmm. 96 looking good, though. <laughs> In case you missed it, coming up next. <laughs> It's another back to school Tuesday. It is August 16th. Some Valde students are now back in class. Sacred Heart Catholic School welcoming students back yesterday. After the deadly shooting at Rob Elementary, many parents in Uvalde decided to pull their children out of the public school 
and put him in private school. Sacred Heart Catholic School says they began the year with more than 100 students in Uvalde. That's more than double their normal enrollment since last fall. The school year started with a special mass officiated by Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra. The search is on this afternoon for a hit and run driver who sent a man to the hospital overnight. San Antonio police say one of their own officers witnessed the whole thing. He said that someone was driving a silver car and hit a man who was just walking along the highway. That car never stopped to help. The man was taken to University Hospital with life-threatening injuries. The Department of Justice pushing back on efforts to unseal the public affidavit supporting the Mar-a-Lago search warrant. Federal prosecutors say releasing the entire affidavit would provide a roadmap to its investigation into former President Donald Trump. Now, affidavits are not typically disclosed during an ongoing investigation to ensure the integrity of the process. A federal judge has called a hearing for Thursday to decide whether that affidavit David should remain sealed from public view. Famous rapper Snoop Dogg has a new business venture and it involves breakfast. It's a new breakfast cereal called Snoop Noops. The product comes from Snoop's food line that was co-founded with fellow rapper Master P. His food line's website says it helps support charities including Door of Hope which supports the homeless community. That's all our time. Thanks for watching the news at 6. See you back here at 10.